Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all hear me and see me okay. Um, welcome to November's webinar. Um, and this month we're covering a very important topic entitled COPD. Um, we hope today to cover the management and treatment of COPD. My name is James. I work here in Fleming Medical. Um, for those of you who don't know Fleming Medical, we are an Irish-based family-run company headquartered here in Limerick with over 30 years experience in both the pharmacy, in-hospital and community care market. Um, and we provide nationwide support in terms of service and sales and um, aftercare for all our products. Um, so over the last year we've we've started um online education and webinar sessions and the idea behind this is to get the best achievable outcome from all of our products um, and that's through providing customers with support as well as the our our end users um you at home or any of your loved ones that you are caring for um we're delighted today to have that I am joined by Eamon Brady, who is owner of Wheelhens Pharmacies in Mullingar. And hopefully, I'll be handing over to Eamon now, but hopefully you'll be able to take loads from Eamon's experience um, as a pharmacist and treating and seeing COPD for, from his years of experience. So if at any stage you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. We will answer all the questions at the end, but for now, I'll hand you over to Eamon and we'll take it from there. So, uh, morning everybody. Thanks for um, to Fleming and the, the um, staff for inviting me today. So, um, I'm going to talk about the background to COPD and um, so, like, I'll go into a bit more detail. I'm a pharmacist in based in Mullingar. Um, so, I do see COPD um, you know, we deal with a lot of COPD patients. Um, for those pharmacy staff here um, that are on board here, I suppose we've seen in the last few years a lot of new inhalers, which um, like Ultibro and Seabree and um, like um, and so on. So it, it can be, a, sometimes it can be a challenge to keep up with the new inhalers. Like the fact that, and these, these inhalers can be very effective for COPD because for a long time, COPD was, um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't much new products came in the market, inhalers or device came in the market. And in the old days, Theophylin, which is an old, um, very old drug with potentially a lot of side effects, was used very regularly. So it's great that new inhalers have come on board. Um, so I will um, discuss just um, the effects, um, the effects, symptoms, diagnosis very briefly. James at the end will talk a bit more about the, the product use diagnosis, like um, the spirometer, um, and, and so on, and even like the like some pulse oximeters, the roles in in um, play there. A little bit about nebulizers as well. I won't go into much detail on nebulizers. I'll talk about treatment, a bit about breathing techniques, and yeah, then James will do the diagnostic um, products and so on. So the um, what is COPD? So in the old days, COPD was called bronchitis. We've all heard of bronchitis, and basically it was wasn't the most accurate term. So COPD um, stands for um, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's um, it, now it's it's two types. It's chronic bronchitis. Well, it's more than two types, but the main two types is chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And um, chronic bronchitis um, affects the large airways, so and um, mainly, but also can affect the small airways, which leads to um, bronch um, bronchitis, which can, may progress to a condition called fibrosis. And fibrosis is where the scarring on the um, on the tissues in the in the lungs and um, that's scary um it can basically make means that the airways are are more stiff or they're taken so they're not as effective at um at like allowing you um breathe and, and the exchange of oxygen um and then there's lung um in emphysema this there's a term called lung pharyn pharyngima and that's a that's basically the portion of the lungs basically the portion of the lungs that that um, allows the gas exchange is damaged, so the parenchyma are, are um, damaged. So emphysema is a more um, 
I suppose you classify it as a more severe form of um, COPD. It's, it's generally all, it's always caused by emphysema. Now, chronic bronchitis, sorry, emphysema is always caused by smoking, sorry. Um, and chronic bronchitis is, is often caused by smoking as well, actually 80% of cases. So COPD cannot be reversed or cured um, due to lung damage, but symptoms can be relieved. But like for those of you listening that have COPD, it is very effectively um, managed nowadays compared to a few years ago. So like I've seen some of these inhalers, you know, the likes of Ultipro and so on, change people's lives. So um, it's, it's not something that should be a life sentence anymore. Um, uh, as a as the condition progresses, basically the inflammatory response appears to increase with the severity of the disease. That's the opposite effect to other chronic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or interstitial lung disease. Like interstitial lung disease is like the likes of um, pneumonia and and so on. But um, but basically it does as with COPD it does gradually progress and get worse. There's area limitations, so basically if difficulty breathing in and out, it makes normal activities um, more difficult. So walking up up the stairs, lifting, um, um, exercise, so you just short a breath um, can be short breath quite quickly. The potential there is a potential risk of heart failure if oxygen flow to the heart is restricted. Is restricted, so it is a complication of severe COPD. Um, the, there's a thing called the FEV1 to F VC ratio, and that's the ratio of forced, forced expiratory volume in the first second um, to forced vital capacity. So basically, in very simple terms, it's the force of your breath in the first in your first second. So any of you that have um, ever used a spirometer, which James will talk about later, um, it's your basically you you breathe in slowly and then you blow in you're told by the doctor or the nurse to blow into the spirometer quickly over a second as hard as you can so that's basically gets that ratio and the world health organization gold standard um or gold definition for error limitation is less than 70 percent so it should normally be 80 percent or more you know in somebody with very healthy lungs like over 85 percent um now i mentioned earlier smoking so 80 percent of copd cases is caused by smoking um, not all smokers will clinically develop um, significant COPD, but studies show that if smokers live long enough, so basically if something else doesn't get them, um, they will develop COPD or some form of airway limitation eventually. Um, less common cause of COPD is passive smoking. I suppose with the smoking ban nearly 20 years ago, it's becoming a less of an issue, but you would see people who worked in bars and smoke environments years ago um, would have developed, come on to develop COPD. Pollution, it's a like it has a big problem, especially in um, in like countries like China, India, you know. So um, it's brought on so big COPD problems, um, fumes and dust, and being born. You can actually be born with be, being more susceptible, susceptible, susceptible. Jeez, I lost my train of thought. Susceptible to the condition. So there is a genetic link sometimes. Um, so the most common um, symptoms include wheezing, shortness of breath. Um, repeated lung and chest infections. Um, the risk there with the repeated chest infections, it does bring on more um, 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 inflammation, narrows the lungs further. Um, and also pneumonia is a big um, issue with um, COPD um, patients. So you are more risk. Like um, the, the, main, um, the main bacteria that cause pneumonia is streptococcus pneumoniae. And it is um, like most of us most population would have would be exposed to it but when you have um copd because of like your lungs are quite clogged with with um mucus and that you are more there is more risk of the bacteria spreading so more risk of that tight chest severe um coughing in the morning that's often one of the first signs actually and you're coughing up catar um, or sputum or phlegm in the morning persistent coughing um mucus and phlegm and difficulty breathing um, the symptoms are often worse in in the winter, or and they're that's because they're exacerbated by cold air. Sometimes asked why does cold weather um, make the symptoms of COPD or, like, or even asthma and breathing problems more um, um, worse during the winter? So basically, it's because it's the body's compensatory factor or factor. So during cold weather, um, the blood vessels in the body constrict or narrow. It's the body's natural way of keeping you warm, but then that 
that goes on to deprive the heart of oxygen so the lung lungs must work harder so somebody does without um a breathing difficulty without asthma or copd that's not an issue but if you've already got a breathing problem the fact that the lungs have to work harder it exacerbates the problem um first signs so when to basically these are the signs so for pharmacy staff on this this and pharmacists this is when to we should be referring to a gp so an increasing breathlessness when exercising and moving around persistent cough with phlegm that never seems to go away frequent frequent chest infections particularly in the winter and um, diagnosis determined by a combination of factors um so basically a doctor we mentioned some of these already but a doctor this these symptoms here will help um a doctor diagnose copd so the ones we talked about already so shortness of breath that's persistent and progressive and get, so getting worse airway blockage um and that's evidence via spirometer so you do that um fev1 um reading um a cough sputum wheeze particularly in the morning exercise intolerance ronchi which is like a rattling sound when breathing um peripheral edema so swelling um like say in the ankles and so on chest hyperflation hyperinflation so your chest um seems to get bigger basically it's the body again it's the body's compensatory factor so the lungs get bigger because they're compensating for not being able to exchange gas so um it's the body's natural mechanism but it doesn't improve the symptoms and then risk factors such as smoking so if somebody a smoker the doctor's more likely to diagnose um diagnosis so spirometry you mentioned that so that's where the person blows into um, a tube device which james talked a bit more and um, um chest um radiography so that chest actually will certain or will ascertain if there's expansion of the lungs um which i mentioned a ct scan so it's actually more to ct scan is also more to rule out other conditions so be it might rule out um like for example if lung cancer pneumonia and um other um lung conditions blood tests so can indicate um if there's anemia so that can be a problem with this low um less um, oxygen in the blood which could be down to um copd um polycythemia that's excessive red blood cells in it so basically that's indicating that the body's not getting enough oxygen due to lung damage um treatment so there's no cure for copd as I mentioned but symptoms can be very adequately relieved um so i suppose the number one treatment if somebody was doing nothing else giving up smoking is number one if you talk to any um respiratory expert that's number one um, you've got your inhalers and nebulizers, exercising regularly, which can be a challenge. And I suppose it's a bit of a facial circle. So it's a person, their breathing is, is difficult. They're finding it more, um, more difficult to exercise. So then, you know, if you can put on more weight, which can exacerbate the problem. Eating a balanced diet, drinking plenty of fluids is important because that does, has been proven to, um, to liquefy mucus as well. A home humidifier, um, is very, can be very effective and, um, can be we find that very helpful for people um james will talk a bit more about that um so proper inhaler technique is very important so um and that's the role for any of the pharmacy teams that are listening um like showing the patient you're going through slowly with a patient like only takes a couple of minutes of consultation room so making sure that the patient shakes the inhaler say it's a meter dose inhaler that um that's got the little canister with it like so, like you can hear you can um hear the sound of the liquid when you shake it so basically make sure that's shaking like 10 to 15 times taking off the cap the the patient should breathe out empty the lungs fully and then to put the inhaler to the mouth and as they're pressing a sharp deep breath the person the patient should hold the um try to hold the breath for 10 seconds to try to get as much of the um drug into the lungs um and so like you do find patients just um especially with like of salbutamol or venting inhaler it's just like it's it take puff after puff without inhaling properly so um and yet you if you're taking like too much venting first of all it means that um it's not working it's not working as what well, or it's your symptoms are under control but also it can potentially cause side effects such as dizziness and so on and then um smoking is like i don't need to mention it again but giving up smoking is is massive so the inhalers so basically i'll we'll talk a bit about the um different inhaler so the short acting bronchodilator so this these are like essentially your blue inhalers there's two types saba which is like yeah short acting bronchodilators which are beta agonists so that's like your salbutamol which is your which is your um your fentanyl is the brand or salamol brands in ireland 
um, terbutalin, which is like brick and an inhaler. And then there's SAMA. So SAMA is um, a typo there, but it's a short acting anti muscarinic inhaler. So ipratropium is an example. So atrovent inhaler, somebody would have seen that. And there's atrovent nebules as well, which are on the market. Um, this, there, it's actually the salbutamol is most commonly used one there. So they act, deliver a small dose of medicine directly to the lungs, in, um, so causing bronchial dilation. So the airways open up. And then it prevents hyperinflation, so over expansion of the lungs. Um, so then you have longer acting um, inhaler classes. So if uh, them short acting don't work, then there's um, three options here. So um, there's a long acting anti muscarinic um, antagonist. So they um, they always the drug in that always ends with not yeah always actually ends with IUM. So thiotropium which some of the farm staff there you'll recognize as Spireva. You got Glycotropium, which is Seabri, S-E-E-B-R-I, or um, there's um, Actlidinium, um, which is the Aslera inhaler. So they're, they're long-acting. They can be quite effective. We'll talk a bit more. Then you have the Laba, which are long-acting bronchodilators. So Salmeterol is, is um, an example of that. And then you got um, inhaled corticosteroid inhalers. They are generally often, or they, not always, but often end with O-N-E. That's how you recognize them in the pharmacy shelf, for example, or if you're prescribed them. So like beclometasone, fluticasone. It's few, they don't all end with O-N-E. There's um, budesonide, which is pulmacort, but most of them end with O-N-E. So if you, see, if you see your inhaler has I-U-M at the end, it's a anti-muscarinic. If it's OL, it's often an acting bronchodilator or a short acting, and ONE, um, a corticosteroid. The, um, so there's two types of long acting bronchodilators. So um, there's the LABA, which we call LABA and LAMA. So LABA is um, long acting beta agonist. So two types, salmeterol and um, formoterol. So cerevent and oxus. They're rarely if actually really never prescribed on their own now due to poor results so the more commonly um prescribed in combination with corticosteroids in fact studies on the long acting beta agonists on their own show that they actually can um exacerbate symptoms in in asthmatics and copd so you'll always get them that's why like you'll never see a cerevent on its own anymore um come now yeah combination examples i'll talk more about this in a few minutes but you have fluticasone and salmeterol, which is like serotide discaler or evahaler or the Airfluzal brand. The budesonide and formoterol combination, with Simbacort, which is quite commonly used. There is another one called Airbufu, which is I think it's made by Roa. And fluticasone and um, filanterol, which is Relfar um, Elipta, which is one of the newer ones. So one thing about um, inhaled corticosteroid inhalers, they're more effective in asthma than um, COPD. So... I'll go on to that a bit more detail in a minute. Um, so a bit more about the long-acting anti-muscarinic. So these are the your inhalers I mentioned that end in IUM. So it's thiotropium, which is spireva. There's a few types the spireva, like there's um there's a spireva, um, um there's normal spireva inhaler and a spireva recipe mesh, which is a newer type, which is meant, meant to get be more effective at getting into the lungs. There's a generic actually called Braltus as well, it's made by Roa, this in Ireland. Um, there's dicoprinium, which is um Seabree inhaler, and then as acidinium, which is the Eclera inhaler. The type of thiotropium is of the three of them, thiotropium, um, there's more studies on thiotropium, but like really there's no there's no evidence that one is better than the other. Um they do, but they do all produce better lung function, fewer hospitalizations, and fewer acute COPD episodes. They definitely um, improve quality of life and few um fewer serious side effects and better control um so they're the preferred option for copd so it's um they are like um life-changing in a lot of patients and i've seen like i've had even recently patients um discussing their inhalers and see how it changed their life to um to a, a, a real positive effect um inhale corticosteroids so the 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 action the reason or sorry their action is to mimic um natural hormone cortisol they reduce area inflammation. Um, they they do they're often in combination, which I mentioned, but they do not dis slow disease progression in COPD. So for moderate to severe COPD, an inhaled corticosteroid can be combined with the long-acting beta agonist, which I mentioned, and um, 
and it's often started with a four-week trial. Now, the reason um, clinicians and doctors do this four-week trial is sometimes um, it can be very difficult for doctors to um, differentiate between asthma and um, COPD. So basically, they do this four-week trial of an inhaled cortic steroid. If the patient's symptoms significantly improve, it can point to asthma. It doesn't always mean it, but it's a good way for a doctor to distinguish. So, um, and the types of inhaler, sorry, inhaled cortic steroids, I mentioned them already, beclometasone, budesonide, and fluticasone. So that's like becotide and beclazone for um, for beclometasone, budesonide is pulmacort, fluticasone is fixatide, just for to familiarize that with the brands. Um, each appears to be equally effective. So no, you know, you can't say one is better than the other because we are uh, sometimes in the pharmacy, which is best. Um, and I suppose the key with them is that they're that the, it's bit like it's more so for, they are used more for asthma, but in asthma care, the key is starting at the lowest dose and increasing slowly up. The main side effects of the steroid inhalers is, is thrush. So thrush of the mouth, um, because the steroid, like the, the especially, especially more so than even the powder inhalers, but the the um, the extracts of the steroid in the mouth can bring on thrush. So the patient is advised to wash them out, or rinse them out after using. Just water is fine. They don't need any special um, mouth rinse or whatever. Um, so um, still on combination inhalers. So um, you, yeah, basically in these combinations, so on top of bronchodilators with the um, corticosteroids, on top of your simba corps, your serotides and so on. They, in studies, they have, they bring up, uh, they um, have approximately 20 few, 25% uh, fewer COPD um, exacerbations as, than placebo. So basically um, reduce the symptoms by 25%. I mentioned the examples already. Um, um, there was some studies to indicate that um, in the, um, in that caterol was more effective than other lab as improving lung function and symptoms. So um, it should, it could be taken into account. Top of that, and more about that in a minute. Um, so combination now there is combination of um, anti muscarinics and the long acting beta agonists. So basically, it's got the your anti muscarinic which has opened the airways. But plus your beta ag long acting beta agonists will also open there with. So three types. The brands that you that those working in pharmacy will recognize is Ultipro, um, Spiral Sp Spiralto, which is the same makers as Spireva, and um Anora Lepta. So they're all combination ones. And they um now the combination showed similar outcomes in clinical trials. But as I mentioned in the last slide, the 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 um the ingredient um, in DAC at Terol in Ultibro has seemed to show um, like good results in clinical trials. But of them three inhalers, none of them seem to be any better than the others. Ultibro is probably the one you see most commonly. It's one of the, it was the first of them that came come out. So it's the, there is, um, but no matter which one a patient described, they won't find anyone any better. Um, and then. Um, other types of treatments. So theophylline, I mentioned near the start, it's an older type of drug, has potentially more side effects um, and interacts with a lot of medicines. Now, you do see patients on it, and if somebody's listening and they're on it, it can be very effective, but I suppose because the inhalers are so um, effective, it doesn't need to be used as much nowadays. It's got what's called a narrow therapeutic index, so it's, it's very easy to it's it's like it's quite difficult for a doctor to get the exact dose that's right for that patient so it can be under treated or over treated quite quickly um mucolytic mu, uh, mucolytic tablets or capsules and it comes in liquids as well i should have mentioned there so they thin the mucus and phlegm allowing it to be coughed up easier so those who work in pharmacies or or those who have got cough mixtures in the past like expitex um uh, which is carbis, um, carbocysteine is is the ingredient of that. XPX be a brand, Fiscal X and so on. Um, there are dotten capsules is on prescription is a is another brand. Um, the question it's a, it's questionable how effective they are, but there is definitely some benefit, but might be majors. Nebulizers in more severe COPD have a major benefit for patients and um, gets more drug into the lungs quicker. Um, and James will talk about that um, in a minute. One one thing about nebulizer, I suppose I'm asked sometimes, so I deal with nursing homes a lot, and um, the, if you're to use, say a patient is on uh, a beta agonist and a steroid, 
nebulizer, which one to use first. So always use the beta um, agonist, so you use salbutamol first, because that opens up the airways, and then you use the um, the um, inhaled corticosteroid or the inhaled anti-muscarinic, which would be like at prevent, because you just you want to open up the airways, and then more of the, once you use the other one, secondly, more more goes in the lung. Same inhaler. So somebody's using um, salbutamol, like a ventral inhaler, and are prescribed another inhaler like um ultibro if they use both use the vents first because open up the airways you know but look if the ultibro and the other inhalers the venture inhalers are working you won't need to use the habutamol of ventilin as much um oral cardiac steroids so short course of oral cardiac steroids may be required for acute flare-ups shouldn't be used regularly but they do have a role in people with you know especially if they have like um, a chest infection and so on long term like because steroids like people find it does really help breathing but the problem is long-term side effects like gastrointestinal problems that can increase weight um issues with the with the um kidneys and so on antibiotics so copd uh, patients often contract chest infections i mentioned pneumonia is a risk factor but like so many other different types of chest infections they're more prone to now there is a thing it's more come to the fore in recent years so longer term maintenance therapy so basically prophylactic which means preventative it's a medical term for preventative use of long-term maintenance antibiotic is considered for those with increased risk of acute ac exacerbations of COPD. So those of you working in the dispensary will, will see have seen patients prescribe maybe long-term a, a macrolide antibiotic called azithromycin. So it might be on the patient might be on it every day or they might be on it three days a week. So you often get it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and so on. And they that is the preventive action, but it's actually more important, probably more importantly. It's been discovered that these uh, macrolide antibiotics actually have an anti-inflammatory effect. So that actually might be the, the real reason they're in benefit in the patient. Um, Long-term oxygen therapy can really, if somebody, especially like if they're more end-stage COPD or severe um, COPD, it does change the quality of life. And um, like, I've, like, listen, you know, I've, I've heard some consultants talk about oxygen therapy and it can increase, not just in quality of life, but they're actually their... Um, it can increase the number of years that the person lives as well. Hospitalization maybe is can be um, uh, needed for uh, in, if somebody has acute flare-ups of COPD. And um, um, so breathing techniques. So before we go on to James, just my final part here. So there, the, um, now the CO, the the COPD COPD.ie. Um, has a uh, very good um videos on breathing techniques so we'll explain it and demonstrate it a lot better than i can explain here but breathing techniques do really uh, can be really a part of um an excellent part of management if the person sticks with it so this purse slip breathing this diaphragmatic and um, breathing and position of ease is another type but they have excellent videos on that and um, purse slip breathing this has improved um oxygen exchange at the end point of the lungs and helps prolong the breathing so basically very simply the person takes a deep breath in they breathe out slowly with pursed lips like blowing out a candle for twice as long as you inhale for so you breathe in for two seconds breathe out for four seconds um and then the key to this is to breathe um slowly and smoothly without exertion so the idea is like it's nearly like training the lungs improving the the muscle function of the lungs um, diaphr um, diaphragmatic breathing, so it comes from the diaphragm, hence the name, but it helps um, relieve breathlessness and improves um, lung, mechanic, um, lung mechanics and increases oxygen to the lungs. So this can be done either sitting or standing. So the, the person places one hand on, the, on their upper abdomen and the other on the front of the chest. The breathing breathing slowly through the nose and exhales slowly again through pursed lips, so it's not that similar to the her slips type. The ideal time to do this is after using an inhaler. Um, for best effect, avoid taking large deep breaths as, bef um, as before. So should, as before, it should be slow and smooth. Practice makes perfect. You um, use this when um, when you're severely breathless. And having tried um, having to try to trust the medic can help reduce panic and fear. So not just a training the lungs, but actually helps you get more oxygen into the lungs, that technique. And there's excellent videos on COPD. Um, and then positions of ease. Um, it's it's uh, useful if it if a short um, if, if yeah if you're short of breath through exercise or when out and about walking and or shopping and so on. 
So if you feel really short of breath, best to stop and take a few minutes to use this technique. So the method is to lean, um, sit down, lean forwards, and rest your um, elbows on your lap. If you can't sit, alter this method to lean against the wall, perhaps for support. This position helps relax your shoulders and the breathing muscles and the diaphragm. Concentrate and inhaling through the nose and breathing um, slowly out through pursed lips again. And um, similar to breathing techniques, the key is slow and smooth, breath, um, regular breaths. So like these techniques, they, when you're short of breath, um, they can help just get more oxygen into the lungs. They're simple techniques. So it's um, well worth um, learning more about them if you are living with COPD. So I think I'm on to James now. So James is going to talk about some of the diagnostic and therapy tools that I mentioned in, in my piece there. Thanks a million, Eamon. Um, you can hear me all right now again, yeah? Yep. That's good. Um, I think I've learned an awful lot there, but one of the key standout slides or points that you did talk about was one of the inhalers was shown to reduce exacerbations of COPD by 25%. Um, and I think when we, from from a pharmacist perspective, that's brilliant, but from a sales or training perspective, from the likes of us here in Fleming Medical, when we are providing products, it's easy to provide products, um, but it's always best that we can aim to get a really good outcome from these products. So there's a few tips and tools I'll try and teach you whether you do suffer with P COPD or a loved one does, or whether you work in a pharmacist or retail setting, that there's just some questions that's always nice to ask yourself about this patient or customer whoever is coming in the door i know i'm a nurse by trade i work in the emergency department in galway uh, university hospital and copd right now unfortunately is presenting like copd patients will always go through slight exacerbations and decrease in their lung functions throughout their life but when you are presenting to hospital now you're you're ticking a lot of potential covid boxes because the breathlessness is there all all the rest of the symptoms potentially are there the cough everything else so what we really need to focus on is keeping you as well as you can be in the community and from Eamon's perspective or any other pharmacy's perspective what i'd encourage you all to do is engage with your pharmacist at all times be it around inhaler techniques or medications um, that you do get that five to 10 minutes, even once a month or once every three months, just to ask one of the pharmacy staff, can you observe me taking my inhaler or from a pharmacist or pharmacy staff's perspective, switch that around, ask your customer, would you mind if I observed your inhaler technique? Because all these small tips can keep patients out of hospital and well at home in their community with their family and friends, which is key. So some products that we supply that would be related to COPD management. So we spoke about humidifiers earlier. I'll go through them in more detail in a later slide. We have a um, peak flow meter there as well, and um, pulse oximetry devices and nebulizers. So the first slide I'll bring you to is none of them it's a spiro scout um, and a spiro scout is, is is a brand specific name for a spirometry unit so anybody with copd hopefully at some stage will will have had a lung function test and in hospital the lung function tests can be really big cumbersome machines that you need gas to calibrate the machine, so on and so forth. So what we have, and they are in certain pharmacies in the country now, are this is effectively a full lung function test. It will produce all the same results that your in-hospital device will um, and validated to the same standards. So if you're lucky enough to be in a pharmacy who has one of these devices, um, you can always get a full spirometry unit there. The beauty of this device is that it, it takes zero seconds to calibrate and there's no gas required for it. But what it does from a patient's perspective, it, it tells us 
how healthy are our lungs at this point in time and if you will have had more than one result you can you can basically have a look at it and analyze to see is my lung function improving or is it disimproving as time goes on um, and the FVC FVC FEVC all these lung volumes and um, these are all different ways of looking at different aspects of lung health and this small machine here is able to tell us these results that are really important to us uh, a peak flow meter is probably one of the gold tools or gold standard tools of measurement for, for lung health or COPD management. And I don't have one with me here at this second, but they're a small portable device. And the idea of the device is to measure the amount of air somebody can exhale from their lungs in w over one forced breath. Um, and if you do suffer from COPD or any of your family or friends do, I'd encourage you to mention about a peak flow meter to them. The reason we talk about peak flow meters is it's always good to have a reading when somebody feels well and also when they start to tell you that they might feel unwell. So we can compare on this peak flow meter that in the past when you said you felt well, your peak flow meter was reading at about 500 or 550 now it's decreased to 300 or 350 as a reading so we can know by just telling us that number right there's a certain issue here and then you can go to your pharmacist or your gp and see how you'd address that issue so it's it's about proactive management um, and keeping you well or as well as you can be for longer the next three slides just give us an indication of how you would take a peak flow meter uh, reading if anybody has any questions at any stage as i said earlier we have a team throughout all of ireland be it on the road or here in the warehouse in limerick that feel free at any stage to give us a call whether you work in a pharmacy or you're a patient and we'd be happy to talk you through any of our devices pulse oximeters a uh, great tool the idea of these is there nowadays we have portable devices in hospitals you'd see quite big cumbersome devices attached to leads. Um, these are produce the exact same readings um, and they're portable. So from a patient perspective, yet again, we're sending the healthcare home and keeping you well in the community, which is always our aim. And a peak flow meter or a, apologies, a SpO2 meter will just give us a reading of the oxygen level in your blood. So something to, yet again, check it when you feel well check it when you don't feel as well and then if you feel like there's an exacerbation of co or pd or your lung health give us that number or reading and we'll be able to take it um or your pharmacy and you'd be able to engage with your health from there on the screen here there's two um, separate pulse oximeters one is on this left of the screen it says a digital pulse oximeter and the other one on the right says bluetooth the difference is Bluetooth, um, obviously, and this Bluetooth pairs up with our uh, smart health health management system, um, which we'll talk about later. The next item, this is pulse oximeter readings as well, if you want to break down as to what the results actually mean for you. But in summary, it's a, it's a number, be it 90 or 80 or 70 or even 100%. And that equates to the amount of oxygen that's freely available in your body. Our smart health management app, uh, also known as LifeSense. So this brings me back to the 25% fewer CEOPD exacerbations with a, a particular inhaler that Eamon spoke about earlier. Um, we need to really proactively engage with health and management of health, uh, but not alone or inhalers or our medication or anything of that sort. Lifestyle is also hugely important uh, as we talked about. So our LifeSense app is a, it's a platform that allows you to manage and track your health in, in one platform. So be it on your smartphone or on your iPad or laptop or whatever. So we have a full suite of products um, like our Medicare LifeSense pulse oximeter that will pair via bluetooth up to this app 
we also have a weighing scales we've a, a number of devices but by engaging with your health on this app you can track it and manage it and get the best achievable outcomes for your health nebulizers are the next product um a gold standard pc kit that's been around for years most people will know a compressor nebulizer um, and a compressor nebulizer we have them they should be available in all good pharmacies or as they say um, and compressor nebulizers have a really high compression rate so what they do is they they generate you put in a liquid into a chamber and inside in the compressor nebulizer it generates a steam or a vapor from that and then when you have a good seal created around your airway then the patient would inhale that and it will get delivered to the lungs now depending on the liquid that's been put into the chamber it can be delivered to different parts of the lungs so compressor nebulizers are brilliant um, and if you need any training around your compressor nebulizers give us a, a, a call text or email at any stage but compressor nebulizers we have to remember are they're not very portable um, and yet again when we want to keep people as well as possible in the community we don't want to keep them indoors all the time um, so we came up with a portable nebulizer this portable nebulizer i'll just i have one here now just for size and scale it's a really small pocket like device it will fit in your pocket um, and the idea of this is always to be used as a secondary nebulizer so never as a primary nebulizer so you'd always if you do need a nebulizer you need a compressor nebulizer but for instance if you were going if you were traveling or if you had something on that day or for just peace of mind or security you wanted a nebulizer to put in your luggage or in your bag you can always take the portable nebulizer with you it's a really good piece of kit um, and you're engaging all the time with your health. Obviously, nebulizers, like any device, needs maintenance. We have a full consumable range for your nebulizer. So if you do buy a compressor nebulizer in six months or nine months or 12 months time, you can go back into your pharmacy and pick up your uh, new mask or new tube and or whatever you do need for that device all of our devices are supported um and that's what we aim to do humidifiers um then as eamon mentioned earlier i'd consult your pharmacist if you're in a pharmacy obviously you're going to pick one of these up and um, just ask the pharmacy staff or pharmacists whether they think a humidifier is good for you at that point in time, they're hugely beneficial um, to lots of people. Um, but yet again, engage all the time, all the time. Just encourage that that questioning. Question everything. Ask your pharmacist, would he or she recommend a humidifier at this point in time for you um, and go with their advice? Uh, COPD, then assets, educational leaflets, and so on. Our marketing team will send everybody a follow-up email with this information in it, should any of you need it. And we'll also have this webinar recorded for you. Um, so for now, I believe I'm at the end of my slides. So that's great. Um, and now I'll just pop over to the questions and answers section. If anybody has any, feel free to type them in and I can ask Eamon to answer them or I'll try my best. I'll just pop in here to the chat. You can answer that, James. Perfect. How often should you use a peak flow meter or pulse oximeter yet again these are all tools that are I, I, we're trying to encourage good health and um, lots of times people jump to devices when they feel unwell or when they feel like they might begin to become more breathless as time goes on and um, so it's as often as you feel necessary i'd imagine a peak flow meter 
certainly once a week when you're feeling well um, or if there's absolutely no change in your peak flow over three to a six month period maybe space it out to two weeks uh, intervals but it's when it's to have that reference point all the time as to when you felt well your peak flow reading was x or y so that you can then when you do talk to your pharmacist or your gp that you have that as a reference point for them would that be right Eamon, or what would you suggest yeah there? yeah that's good advice james and i suppose if um like it depends on your situation if you're so if say you're under like your pulmonary ex, um, specialist and he he or she is looking um is really monitoring you you know see seeing how your inhalers are getting on like what what they talked about that they're they're trialing you know like a combination one or they're trying to rule out asthma trialing the long acting bronchodilators and um with the inhaled corticosteroids and i say the trial in a serotide or a simbacord they might actually ask you to do it twice a day for a few weeks to your next appointment to, you know to give an indication but you know what in general what you said is is perfect james perfect um i think that's pretty much it for now um oh, as i said earlier th well thanks a million to Eamon anyway for his time and expertise and if any of you are in mullingar and have any questions be sure to pop in <laughs> uh, in the middle of vaccination season <laughs> um but thank you all for your time and if any of you have any questions feel free to let us know at any stage um and we'll be sure to get back to you our marketing team will follow up with a recording of this webinar if you feel like it might be beneficial to somebody else feel free to send it on to them but for me and everyone here in fleming medical thank you all for your time this morning thank you thanks amen <laughs>